the Raja Tani Kumita. Or John will ever meet you. Or John won't ever meet you. <laughs> now this sentence, A and C, are severely deviant. So much so that they feel like agreement violation or order violation. Yet, they want to claim that they are deviant because they are contradictory. In a sense which is related to, but also distinct from, it trains and it doesn't train. And if this claim doesn't make any sense to you, you're right, no? You're for one thing. You know, the negation of a contradiction should be a tautology. This is clearly not a tautology. But what's going on? And why would anyone want to make such a disaster? Let me give you some sense of what is the idea behind it. Take a sentence like, how many papers will you have created by tomorrow? So you can answer, not even one. It's perfect. You cannot answer even one. It makes no sense. Well, the reason why it makes no sense is that those even one in this context is a contradiction. And let me walk you through why. Even P, you know, even John showed up, says two things. That John showed up and that he is showing up is the least likely among the relevant alternatives. Now, what would be the alternatives in this case? For instance, if you say I graded even one assignment, it would be I graded an assignment or any end. Those would be probably the relevant salient alternatives. And so you're saying that grading one assignment should be the least likely among the alternatives. But this is a logical impossibility. Because if you grade three assignments, you grade two, you grade two, you grade one, and so on. And so there is an entailment chain of which grading one assignment is the weakest. And you cannot be logically less likely than the things that entail you. No? Because if you are entailed by something, in any circumstance in which that is true, you have to be true. You cannot be less likely than anything. This is a contradiction. And it's one that we seem to conclude an academic and subconscious. <coughs> So I want to apply this to polarity items in general. So polarity items are things like anyone that are very unhappy in positive sense. So if anyone you talk to makes no sense, it's nearly worth salad, I believe that there is anyone to talk to unsurprisingly stays utterly ungrammatical. If you go home, there is anyone to talk to, still terrible, still unsurprising. But now you take that very same string of morph, such as it is, and you move it in other contexts. So for instance, you switch from belief to doubt. I doubt that there is anyone to talk to. Or you move this string from the consequent of a conditional antecedent. If there is anyone to talk to, we will be fine. <coughs> the very same string of words becomes perfect. And you can impress your students and partners with these facts. Now, what is it that Exactly. The questions do exactly the same thing. Yes. Uh, so, um, now the question that you ask immediately is the following. What is the common property where these elements are happening? And it, as it turns out, it's a, an abstract logical property 
It has to do with inference. Some contexts listen, license superset inferences. Positive contexts do that. So for instance, if you yesterday ate pizza with a chubbies, you yesterday ate pizza. So the inference goes from the subset to the superset. Now, the consequent term of a conditional is positive in this sense. So if you say, if I'm nervous, I eat pizza with anchovies, it follows that if I'm nervous, I eat pizza. But the antecedent of a conditional reverses this pattern, just like negation does. So if it's true that if I eat pizza, I get sick, then if I eat pizza with anchovies, I get sick. So you see, it's reversal of directionality of entailment. And this seems to be the property with which any, the distribution of any, correlates. So belief is positive in this sense. If I <coughs> believe that Susan ate pizza with anchovies, then I have to believe that she ate pizza. So you see, the inference goes upward, just like in the consequence of a condition. If I'm nervous, I eat pizza with a chocolate. If I'm nervous, I eat pizza. Doubt, like negation, reverses this pattern. So if I doubt that Sue ate pizza, <coughs> I have to doubt that she ate pizza with a chocolate. And the antecedent of a condition is just like that. So this is very striking and very general. Every, every think of it as taking two arguments. The, first, the one that corresponds to the noun phrase and the one that corresponds to the verb phrase. Everyone ate pizza. So the right argument of every goes up. So if everyone ate pizza with anchovies, everyone ate pizza. The noun part of it goes down, like the antecedent of a condition. So if everyone who ate pizza got sick, then by George, everyone who ate pizza with anchovies got sick. And so it goes like that. It's cross eyed everywhere. And indeed, you see, any is bad here. You cannot say everyone understood anything. But you can say everyone who understood anything complained to me. So the any wants to be in places where the arrow goes down. Okay. A striking fact. Why? So this is a factual generalization. And already the factual generalization reveals that there is some link to reason. The generalization is that any is grammatical in context that generate subset inferences. And it's ungrammatical in context that do not. Here is the basic idea that any is like a covert even one. Let me elaborate on this idea in three steps. The first step to notice is that any is an indefinite. It's German cognitive designing, which is plain, plain vanilla indefinite. At some point, this guy, so it's the root for one plus an adjectival ending. And so it's one lie, something like that. At some point, you know, also Germanic, the thing split. And then it became a polarity system. But retain is indefinite meaning. So I doubt that John saw someone as the same meaning as I doubt that John saw anyone. The basic meaning is the same. Now, every quantification of expression 
comes with an implicit reference to a domain. So if I say someone is looking very powerful, I don't mean someone in the world, but I mean someone in some salient domain. Now, the thing is that <coughs> likes to associate with the broadest possible quantification of domain. And its alternatives are regular, smaller quantification of domain. So, N is a regular indefinite that activates the smaller domain. And it comes with this secret, even like particle. And here is then what happens, right? This is just like even one, right? So a sentence with that is fine. <laughs> Only if that sentence is the least likely. Only if it entails all of its alternatives, the strongest among its alternatives. So, in a positive context, like there is anyone to talk to, this is just like how many people are there to talk to. There is even one person to talk to. This is contradictory. Why is it contradictory? Because this is the assertion that there is someone in a large domain. It should entail its alternative, but it does not, it fails to. So the even requirement cannot be met. And the result is a logical contradiction. On the other hand, if there is negation, then there isn't anyone to talk to. It's just like there isn't even one single person to talk to. Now that is not a contradiction. Why? Because the presence of negation gives you a, a different side at which to check the requirement associated with even in the above negation. And this is saying that even if you pick the largest domain, there still isn't something that you can talk to. So isn't this a kind of a way of figuring out why this guy did the way he does? And it generalizes to all downward entailing concepts. Whenever you have a downward entailing operator, you will be able to check this convert the condition of even at a site where it will allow to pan out. So you don't to take anything specific about that word in data. It simply follows from the meaning of even and the meaning of a downward entailing operator that the two things go well together. Now one reason that gives us hope that this is on the right track is that in about one third, so negative polarity elements exist in every language, some form or other. And roughly in one third of the sample, this even light thing shows up overtly. So for instance, this is an example from Hindi where the um, item that means any is literally formed by the word for one and the word for the even. This is an example from Tagalog when again the word for any is formed from a WH expression, which is a very common strategy, WH works out in that is and an even like particle, a case any. And going more exotic Italian uh, <laughs> You know, you have things like neanche uno, where you see the word for anche, which is also, and also and even are strictly related. And this is an again by the element. It cannot occur in a positive environment. So, 
the case of Egypt is one of the cases that Luigi was talking about yesterday, where the simple switch is that something that happens covertly in many languages happens covertly in others. The visibility of the operator simply got lost. This is our, our, our my favorite cases. Very elusive, very puzzling. So, look at this contrast. And this is my contribution to biology. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> in honor of uh, the concept. <laughs> Dogs don't have ears because of anything we don't. They have ears because they have ears. This is my explanation. Um, this is good, but this is bad. Dog, dogs don't have ears because they have any eyes. That's bad. They have ears because they have ears. You really want to drop that anywhere. Like you would want to say dogs don't have ears because they have eyes. The any there is. So what's coming up? These are alive. I didn't help him because I have any sympathy for our margaritas. That's good. But I doubt that grass is green because it has any problem. That's terrible. Where is my dad going to go? Where is my dad You have to look at the implication of the because clause. Sometimes the because clause is held to be true, and sometimes it's held to be false. So, when I say something like, dogs don't have ears because of anything we don't, what am I assuming? What is the implication there? That dogs don't have anything we don't. They are made like us. So the because clause, this part, is implicated, intimated, suggested to be false, isn't it? I'm not saying that they have anything we don't. I'm maintaining that they don't have anything we don't. <laughs> right? Here is that dogs don't have ears because they have any eyes. And everyone knows that dogs have eyes. Right? So this is maintained to be true. So here is what happened. If the because clause is suggested to be true, any is bad. If it's suggested to be false, any is good. So here you have a totally pragmatic effect any, lo and behold, is sensitive to that. How can we make sense of this? Well, evidently, any is sensitive not to just to the literal meaning, but to the pragmatically enriched so what you do is you look at, the, at your cross, you compute the implications, the suppositions, and what have you. You look at the result. If the result is done by telling, any will be happy. If the result is not done by telling, any will be unhappy. So it's the same condition as in the core cases, extended to pragmatically enriched context. So the semantic mechanism operates blindly. Now, you can imagine, so this is a little bit of the cat, right? This stands for the enrichment, the pragmatic enrichment of a proposition that has a preposition and implication trigger. And so this is simply the sum of the implication 
or the supposition and the assertion. So for example, this is the logical form. Uh, it is not the case that dog and ears because they have eyes. And the rich meaning of that is that dog have eyes and it's not because they do that they appear. So what's going to happen is if you have any there, it's going to be in a positive environment. And therefore the even condition will crash. Okay. This is the working it out, right? So you have, this is a sentence. Dog, dogs don't have ears because they have any eyes. The enrichment of that is that dogs have eyes, and it's not the case, but that. This would be the alternative. This does not entail that. And so there is not a crash. If on the other hand, you have dogs don't have ears because of anything we don't, <coughs> so in this case, you have that the enrichment says that it's not the case that dogs have anything we don't. And furthermore, that's not the reason why they have eyes. And so you see, in this context, any is in a negative environment, so and so. So the even requirement will work out because this isn't this. Isn't that stunning? There is one last point, it is a little bit uh, the trickiest, if you wish. And it's why would any be sensitive to the English meaning? Is that like a primitive? Is that a, like a lexical property that any has that cares for the enriched meaning of its environment? As it turns out, maybe not. Maybe it's a, something technically that brings that about. Think of it as follows. There are two items because and any that requires some attention. Any requires attention because it has this even requirement. And because it requires attention, because it needs to be enriched by an implicature of the supposition. Now in principle, you could take care of these requirements in either order. And as it, as it turns out, only one order delivers the result that we want. Namely, that any is sensitive to the English meaning. And the order is the one in which you first take care of the cause, and then you take care of it. You first enrich the cause, and then you take care of the requirement of any. Why should you do things in that order? Look at it in a tree like fashion. So, this is what requires attention, this is what requires attention. This is the side at which you provide attention. Which of these two guys is closest? Because, of course. So, this is a kind of a <coughs> Minimality effect. You have a, an operator that looks for a target and it has to hit the first it finds, which is the because clause. And so it has to first enrich that and then you go on and you take care of the other guy. So isn't that maybe wrong, but it's terribly interesting. <laughs> so this is the kind of things that the likes of Luigi be talking to you, <laughs> thinking about. So summing up, um, 
There is a reasonable, perhaps a beautiful story as to why languages have negative polarity elements. Negative polarity elements are indefinite with this even-like condition attached to it. And you know, very often you just see it. You just see it with your naked eyes. Sometimes you don't. And the interaction between the meaning of even and the meaning of its environment is such that these guys will be happy only in downward ending context. And moreover, they will be mindful not just of the plain meaning, but of the pragmatically enriched meaning. Something that seems so elusive really falls into the grave. And under the assumption that this enrichment of the basic meaning is obtained to a some kind of operator visible to syntax, you do get via a minimality effect to derive the fact that N is so sensitive to enrich the value. why I really see myself forced to say that what happens kind of visibly in these cases, how many meters will you pay? Not even one. Fine, you don't even think about it. Even one, you can't make sense of it in this context. Notice that it's not that you can't make sense of it in general, right? Let's say, how did the party go? Very well, even one professor came. It's only in certain contexts that it's based. Only when the number is the only choice as to the focus of event. So you see now I really see myself forced to attain that there are any cookies left, fields that maybe walks and talks like an agreement valuation, but has nothing to do with that. Not directly, it's just a contradiction. Like and uh, it's a contradiction that in some sense is not part of the language. And so doesn't this now force me to say, well, Gennaro, come on. You know, how can this possibly be? I mean, you know, they feel so different. Don't you owe us a story as to why the fields are different? And yeah, they I I do. <coughs> and there is a beautiful, let me first try to give you the idea. There is a beautiful sort of algorithmic way of teasing apart the contradictions that feel like ungrammatical and those that are simply logical contradictions. And here is how it goes. Here is how you piece them apart. Um, what you want to do is take the functional skeleton that we can meet in, discussed yesterday of a, of a sentence. So this would be the functional skeleton of there are any cookies there. These are the logical parts, the functional parts, this would be the lexical part. Who is left? Or it rains and it doesn't rain. This would be the functional part <coughs> of the explanation. And this would be the lexical part. Now, grammatical contributions, things that are grammatically trivial and perceived as a grammatical, are those that come out as false under any replacement whatsoever of the lexical material. Grammar just doesn't see it. It's not there. No matter how you replace things, it comes out false. Logic also doesn't care for lexical content. 
but it cares whether two items are the same or not. Right? So you have to do uniform replacement. So something that is logically trivial comes out false for any uniform replacement of its lexical material. And uniform means that if you have a P, you want to replace it with the same thing throughout. Right? So it drains and it doesn't drain. Has to be replaced uniformly. P and not P, Q and not Q. Grammar <coughs> doesn't care even for that. Just doesn't see. And so it drains and it doesn't drain. It's not grammatically trivial because there are ways of replacing it. When you replace it with two different things that are non contradictory. So, this is a wonderful idea based on an idea of Karma by this young man, John Bajewski. Very bright. This is the definition of a phi is grammatical trivia for any replacement of the lexical material, phi comes out both. Phi is logical trivia. For a uniform replacement of the lexical material, phi cannot fall. Uniform means that if P is a lexical component of phi, all the current phi <coughs> must be replaced by the same Q. <coughs> and then, so, grammatical trivia things are not part of that. So these are the main models in the number part. There are complex patterns of structure retrieval on the mathematical judgment that clearly involve a spontaneous capacity for assessing valid inference patterns. And they are based on this concept of grammatical judgment. So Universal grammar is a natural logical system, through and through, even at the interface with grammatics. The natural means that it grows like the end. It's composed of merge, which is a structure building device, and of infer, which is an inferential apparatus. And infer is responsible for the interface properties of the functional system. Core knowledge of meaning is the knowledge, the spontaneous knowledge of the inferential properties of the likes of and, every, ed, if, because, more, any, and the like. So these are the general consequences of school work in this. I'm not going to tell you the concepts and reference don't exist, not that you after having spent half of a life arguing for a derivation of semantics. But without an intellectual apparatus, they are blind. You can't do virtually anything. Just like logical answers to be like this. 